Am I on? Is this thing going to feed back the whole time I'm speaking? We'll see. I'm just so loud. (laughs) It's probably because I'm not loud enough. Sorry, guys. Still kicking out some of this upper respiratory stuff. Thank you all for your prayers for um, Pastor Mike Teagarden this week. He... um, He's been on a a journey of healing and um, had some stuff going on with his health. And um, God has been gracious once again, and he received a victory. And I know that they're going to want to share more with you all about that testimony. But thank you for those of you who who prayed for him and lifted him up. Um, He's doing well and um, hopes to be back with us next week. Amen. So, Mike and Cindy, we send you our love this morning. And... We send our love to Pastor and Paula, and I know Tom and Diana and Pam are all home watching as well. So we miss all of our River family when they can't be here, but we want you guys to just feel like you're right in this room with us. We love you, and uh, we, we send our love and prayers to those who are home because they, they need uh, healing and strength, right? All right, I got to figure out which one of these papers up here is my message. Hang on. I got my service outline, the February declaration. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not, I don't know. I just had to figure it out. We're good. <clears throat> I asked all of these things to be put up here for me, and then I, now I don't know what I have here. All right. Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about first things first. That's the title of my message, media team. They're always asking what's the title so they can put it up on YouTube. Every message has to have a title, right? Did it even exist if it doesn't have a title? It's like if you didn't post it on Instagram or Facebook, did it even happen? There's no internet record of it. Probably not. <clears throat> but today my, my opening text is um, Revelation 2. Um, And Kim, I'm going to have you add verses 1, make it 1 through 5 instead of 4 and 5. Call in a little bit of an audible here on the team. Revelation 2, 1 through 5 says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things I say, these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. I have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else, or else, I will come to you and quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So we're going to dive into the word today. We're going to talk about first, the firsts, right? So we all know first things are often special, right? They're your baby's first steps. You know, we take videos of it. We clap. We cheer. Simeon's first steps video popped up in my feed this week, actually, um, as a memory. And, you know, he's taking those first steps, and we celebrate that. But I I don't film him walking now, right? Because it's not special anymore. He does it all the time. <clears throat> um, first, t- first time home buyer. How many of you in here have maybe been a first time home buyer within this last year? Anybody? Anybody buy a home this year? Oh, we got one back here. So, this, so buying your first home is different, right? It's different than anything else you've ever done in your life. Like, you buy your house, and you're like, oh, this is wonderful, and then everything breaks. <laughs> right? <laughs> that happened to us. We bought this home, and uh, 
you know, lovely little house. We got a good deal on it and needed a lot of work. And so we got the majority of the work done <clears throat> prior to our wedding. And uh, we're on our honeymoon and my parents call and say, well, you know, we're helping you guys out, moving some stuff in and, you know, which is awesome. But your appliances are toast. <laughs> so the house had come with appliances, and we thought, oh, you know, we can make them work for a while. <laughs> They're like, nah. Even the microwave that we bought at an online auction, brand new box, Sears, beautiful microwave, opened the box up, and somebody had returned their old microwave back to Sears in the new Sears microwave box. So even that we didn't have. So I remember, I remember vividly, we're sitting on a beach in Maui, enjoying our honeymoon with our phones in our hands, trying to get in on the, the Sears Memorial Day weekend sale <laughs> to buy our appliances with uh, our wedding money that we had just opened out of all the cards and gifts. So. It's a great way to spend your honeymoon and a few good bonding experience. It's good. But... Your first home, your baby's first steps, maybe for you it's your first grandbaby. We all know the, that experience of that feeling of first, right? And there's something special about it. And so here in Revelation, um, the Lord is, I mean, he's just pouring it on good. He's like loving on this church of Ephesus right here. He's like, you know, you, your patience and you can't bear with those that are evil. You hate the things that I hate, and, you know, and... And I feel like we're kind of where maybe that church of Ephesus found themselves, where we're like, we're patient and we're enduring. We're like enduring the hardships that we're facing and like we're fainting not. We're standing our ground. We're reminding the enemy that he's under our feet and that he doesn't win. But we've got to be so cautious to not find ourselves in the place where the Lord chastised that church for forsaking their first love. Yes, they endured. Yes, they were patient through tribulation. Yes, they hated evil. And yes, they towed the, the straight and narrow. But they had forsaken the place of their first love. So that's what we want to talk about today. Um, a couple weeks ago, Pastor mentioned um, a Bible studying concept called the law of first mention. How many of you know what the law of first mention is? Any Bible study people in here heard that? So it's a term from the, okay, this is a fun word, hermeneutics. And that's like the way, that's like different ways in, uh, to study the Bible. And one of the ways to study the Bible or to study a topic in the Bible or a law or a doctrine is to go and find out where it first happened or it was first mentioned in the Bible. <clears throat> and so they call this the law of first mention. And it's, it's just a piece of the puzzle, right? So... Like um, the first time that, um, I guess, um, let's see, the first time a miracle happens in the Bible or whatever, that's not the full picture of the miraculous, right? It's, it's a piece. It's, it's maybe where it started. It's maybe the origins. Um, but we don't camp out there and only talk about that. So this idea of first mention, it's to help us to embrace more of the Word of God, learn more about the Word of God, and bring a deeper understanding to the Word of God. So <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about that first mention, because the first time some of these things happen in the Bible um, were very important, and it gives us a little bit of a clearer picture of who God is and his attributes of love, which ties us back into remembering the place of our first love. So follow along on this journey here with me. Psalm 148, 13 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. So how many of you got the opportunity to go see the chosen messengers back at Christmas? The chosen, were they handful of you. It was really powerful. It was really good. Um, <clears throat> but they did the names of God. They did like four names of God, and they vi revisited the first time that name for God was used. And so I want to talk through some of those this morning. Um, so we use the term Jehovah Jireh, right? Jehovah Jireh, my 
provider. The Lord will provide. Um, The first time God is known by Jehovah Jireh um, is in Genesis 17, or I'm sorry. Wait, hang on. No, I started on the wrong one. Sorry. (laughs) I wanted to start with just Jehovah. Jehovah is translated as the existing one or Lord. The chief meaning of Jehovah is derived from the Hebrew Hebrew word hava, meaning to be or to exist. It also suggests to become or specifically to become known. So it denotes that God reveals himself unceasingly. So we have Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shammah, and God is continuing to reveal more and more of himself every time he uncovers another one of these of his attributes in the word of God. So El Shaddai is one of these, all sufficient one, Lord Almighty. Genesis 17, 1 says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. So Abram, Abram, this is pre-Isaac and pre-promise because his name is Abram and not Abraham. Um, he, he shows a part of himself to Abram in this instance. So Abram has a first moment type of experience with God, right? He, becomes, he comes to know God as more than what he's known him before. He knows him now as El Shaddai, Almighty God. El Elyon, God Most High. Genesis 14, 18 through 19 says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. So this is a moment of blessing. Here we go. Abraham's getting a little bit more of God revealed to him. Now he, he's known him. Uh, he, he, he learns him as El Elyon, God most high. Then later on he learns him as El Shaddai, all sufficient one or Lord Almighty. Next one, Jehovah Nisi. It's the Lord, my banner. Exodus 17, 14 through 15. Says, then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. So, oh, and Moses built an altar and called its name The Lord is my banner. He built an altar because this is where he knew God as his banner. So in this instance, they're fighting the Amalekites. And this is the story where he's got his staff. And as long as he holds his staff out, the war is raging and the people of God are triumphing, right? They're winning. They're on the winning side. Well, how many of you know you cannot, like, stand there like this for very long? And how many of you know battles are longer than you can hold your arms out like this? <laughs> so he, would, he grew tired and weary, and Aaron and her came up under his arms and held up his arms, and, and the Lord was victorious. And so Moses built an altar and memorial for the first time he knew God as God my banner in this place. Funny story, I was in the car this week. It was, I think it was Wednesday. And I'm, you know, praying about Sunday and <clears throat> I'm just, you know, I'm just getting with it in the car, you know, I'm by myself. And um, no, it was Tuesday because Krista had my boy. That's why I could really get it in the car, you know. And so I've got my music playing and I'm praying in the spirit, and I'm declaring and decreeing, and and all of a sudden I like, I hear heavy breathing to my right and to my left, <laughs> and I look, and both of my dogs are like right here, 
one on each side. And like, if the Lord doesn't have a sense of humor, guess where my mind immediately went? Aaron and her. I'm like, Lord, you even gave me an Aaron and a her here in the car. Thank you, Jesus. And of course, like, killed the moment. Like, <laughs> I was just like, Lord, I just trust you with, with it all. And I'm done. <clears throat> But that's when Moses first knew Jehovah Nisi, God my banner. And even another translation for that, and this is my favorite, the Lord my miracle. God my miracle. So powerful. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer, Exodus 15, 26. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I am your Jehovah Rapha. This is the instance where Moses had put the snake on a, on a pole and something about Moses and the stick, the rod, burr. Moses, the Lord just used that with Moses for some reason consistently. But th- that was the instance sickness and disease had tried to come and, and wage war on the people of God. And God gave an instruction, a very clear instruction, and Moses obeyed it. And he said, if you continue to obey and you continue to heed and seek me first and make me your first love, I will be your Jehovah Rapha. And no, none of the diseases that I've put on the enemy will be put on you. That was a big moment. I don't know. I've not done enough research in the Bible to know how much supernatural healing took place prior to this moment. God is not mentioned as Jehovah God, my healer, prior to this. This is, this is the first mention. So we don't know. We don't know what kind of um, picture this, this had uh, in the minds of everybody. Um, Jehovah Sidkenu, that's a fun word. The Lord my righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6 talks about the Lord my righteousness says in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness here we are Jehovah Jireh finally made it to Jehovah Jireh and aren't you glad Genesis 22 14 and Abraham here we are at Abraham again Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So Jehovah Jireh was a symbolic name given to Mount Moriah by Abraham to memorialize the intercession of God in the sacrifice of Isaac. So this is when Abraham has taken his one son that God promised and gave to him through Sarah in his old age, and God has told him to sacrifice it. You know, it had everything to do with Abraham and how he viewed himself and what he knew he was capable of. It wasn't that God didn't know whether or not Abraham was capable of sacrificing his firstborn son. You know God knew that, right? God knew that Abraham had it, had it in him, but Abraham needed to know that he truly put God first. And then Abraham needed to know God as Jehovah Jireh, my provider, because he interceded and stood between the, stood between Isaac and Abraham when the time was right and provided the sacrifice in the place of Isaac. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. The Lord is absence from strife. The Lord is wholeness. He's tranquility. And he's perfection. Judges 6, 23 and 24 says, Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. 
So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. Gideon had been called upon to lead the armies of the Lord into battle and then to whittle his army down, right? And whittle and whittle and whittle. Now this, this comes before all the whittling down of the army happens. God gives him a promise. God gives him a first time moment. And he says, I am your Jehovah Shalom. Gideon felt unqualified. And so he says, I am God, your wholeness, your completeness, your perfection. And that stood as a rock of peace for Gideon to stand on. Because if he didn't have that word from the Lord, if he hadn't had that moment with the Lord, I don't know if he would have made it through the rounds of carving back his army from 300,000 to 30,000 to the 300, right? He might not would have survived that, but he had a word from the Lord. He had a first moment. He had a first love moment with the Lord to know him as Jehovah Shalom. So the Hebrew people grew up knowing these names of God. And many, 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 uh, and I can put out this week um, on social media, um, there's a list online of a lot of these names in the first time they're mentioned. But many of them only appear once in the Old Testament. So when they heard these names in their teaching and their learning, it took them to a, a specific place to a specific moment, to a specific battle. And they knew exactly what attribute of God that represented. Very, very important um, detail, I think. Another concept of first in the Bible, so we talked about first mention. Another concept of first in the Bible is the concept of first fruits, Right? And a couple of weeks ago, Pastor was talking about when you yield your first fruit, there's no um, greater expression of love than to give your best of your best to your beloved. I give you my very best. I don't want you getting the scraps. I want to give you my very best, right? So concept, concept of first fruits, Lord, I give you my heart. Uh, Lord, I give you the first fruits of my increase, the first fruits of the work of my hands, the things that I do, Lord, my harvest, my love, my devotion. I give you my first fruits. Uh, Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and the first fruits of all your increase. So, whatever area of your life you've been increased in, Proverbs says, Yield the first fruits of that to the Lord. Melchizedek first mention of the first fruit, right? The first tithe was Melchizedek. We talk about that. And then Jehovah Jireh, when Abraham met with, took Isaac to the altar, he was taking a first fruits type of offering, right? And then we learn to know God as Jehovah Jireh through that instance. So this concept of first leads us back to first love, returning to our first love, returning to the place where he called us out, where he met with us. Revelation 2, 4 again, it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent. And do the first works, or else I will come click quickly to you. Uh, no, nope, I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> I will come quickly to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you return to me. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The Passion Translation puts it like this, and I didn't tell them that I was going to read Passion Translation, but it says, he is the head of his body, which is the church, us. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, 
He is the most exalted one holding first place in everything. Preeminence means first place. He takes number one spot. Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the promises of God added, heaped onto you when we seek first, when we remain with our first love. We maintain the place of our first love. So in Revelation 2, 4, he doesn't leave them without a plan to fix this. Now, ultimately, they didn't get it right because we know history books tells us that uh, they, that area was invaded and taken captive and that the church kind of from that area. But he gave them a way of escape. He told, he told them how. So if we consider ourselves to take heed of this this message, this verse, this calling out, if you will, of God saying, you got a lot of things right, but there's some stuff that I need you to to fix up. He gives us a plan. He first says to remember. To remember, to reassemble in your heart and mind. When did he first call my name? When was his first mention of Lori Folden. When did he first call out Tim Reed's name? What is your moment of first mention? Can you re refragment that in your brain and reassemble it and and remember what it felt like that first time he called your name? When did you first know him as Jehovah Jireh? My God will provide. It's not just important that we know Jehovah Jireh, the God that will provide, because he provided for Abraham a sacrifice in place of Isaac, but it's important that we know when he was Jehovah Jireh for me. When was the first time you really knew that no matter what happened, he would be your supply? He would be the God who provides. And Jehovah Shalom, God who is your completion. He's your perfection. He's your wholeness. He's everything you need. That's something you can build on, right? So it's not just important that we know these first mentions when they're in the Bible, but we need to know our first mentions. We need to know the first time he came to us and said these things, and did these things, and revealed more of his unceasingly great being. Remember Jehovah. He's continually revealing himself and revealing attributes of his self to us. It's, it's unceasing. We will never on this earth know the measure and the greatness of all that he is, because it's unceasing. So you know him as Jehovah Jireh and all these things that we have to be grateful for and to give him our first love for, and it doesn't even end there. That doesn't even encapsulate it all. It's not even a tip of the iceberg into who God really is. You guys have seen that demonstration of what you see of the iceberg above the water, and then it's like however many times bigger below the water. That's, that's what it is like serving the Lord. He continues to reveal more and more of himself to us. So it's important that we remember. So many times when God is given a new name or a new attribute in the Old Testament, it's to mark a place. Three of those that I just, just three of the ones I read about just a, a little bit ago, they marked a place where somebody built an altar and set up a memorial. Why? So they wouldn't forget. So they would remember, because they knew how difficult it would be. See, the church at Ephesus, they were into their second generation. So there were some things, the first love moments that first generation Ephesus had, that wasn't getting passed down to second generation Ephesus. So our kids, 
our teenagers, our young ones, they need to have these first mention moments, and they can know your Jehovah Jireh moment. They can know your Jehovah Shalom moment, but they need to know, Paige, you have a God my banner, a God my protector moment for yourself now. You've seen it. You've walked in it. You've got that moment. It's important that we have those for ourselves, and we look back, and it, it, it builds, it has a compounding effect, and we, we hear about it in the Bible, and we experience it for ourselves, and then the next generation comes along, and they experience it, and every time, God becomes greater, and God becomes stronger, and more and more worth our first love. Nothing changes with him. He's not any more deserving, but in our mind, we have more and more to thank him for, right? It has everything to do with what's in our heart. It's important to remember that these things, these attributes of God we've talked about are expressions of his love toward us. We've got to remember that the place, forsaking your first love is... It's not forsaking God or what you believe. And it's not abandoning something that we started. It's not like we've got to drum something up ourselves. It's a response. We have this ability to respond to what God has done for us. It's not like we've got to go and say, oh, I've got to... If just I could, you know, dig up and stir up some love feelings for the Lord today. It's not like that. It doesn't start with us. We love because he first loved us. That's how we get back to that place of first love. It's when did he advance towards you? When was that moment when he came running after you? And then all we have to do is just respond. We just love in kind. When, you know, when a, a young man, you know, gets feelings for a young lady. And he makes a move, right? Suave, debonair, teenage boy, hormonal acne. <laughs> I'm trying to paint a picture for you guys here. And a lot of times, maybe 50% of the time, he'll make his move and the girl's like, oh, <laughs> oh, you're cute. You know, he's so adorable. Mom, he's got curly hair. Right. And the other 50%, it's like, ew. Right. Um. <laughs> But all the girl has to do is respond, right? He's shown his love, and the girl responds. And when it's the one, it's the right one, nothing compares. And responding with your love in return, it's not hard. It's instinctual. It's something that it just bubbles up. So it's not like we've got to go back to this place where he said, no, I just got to, if I could just love the Lord some more, if I could just pray, if I could just read my Bible some more. It's just remember how much he loves you. Just remember what he did for you. We love because he first loved us. That takes us back to the place of our first love. Next thing he said was repent. And repent means to turn right, to turn from whatever it is. And we may not even know what it is, whatever it is that pulled us away from our first love. Like, it can be any number of things, but maybe you just, you don't even know how you got where you are. How did, how did we get here, you know? Have you ever asked that? Have you ever been lost? How did I get here? Somebody tell me. But with God, it's not some cryptic way back. All you have to do is just turn away from what you were turned to. You don't even have to know what it was you were turned to. Just turn back to him. Repent. And then the last thing he calls them to do is to return. 
Not just to turn, but let's make the journey back. Okay, so we, we got a little off course. We get turned a little odd. But I'm going to remember who God is, and I'm going to forsake the things that he's not. He's not over there. He's not where I was. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk back. I'm going to go back to him. No matter, no matter where we are, the way home is always clear. If I could have the musicians come. The way home is always Jesus. It's always his love. We always just need to chart our direction for where we know the love of Jesus to be true in our heart. Jose and Gomer, this picture of the church and God given to us in the Bible through these two uh, individuals. Hosea was a prophet. God called him to marry a harlot. She forsakes him over and over and over again. What does Hosea do? okay come home I never left my love never changed I'm still Jehovah Shalom no matter what you've done I'm still Jehovah Jireh no matter what's mud and muck and mire you've gotten your feet in I'm still Jehovah still your banner I'm still your place of wholeness and perfection Hosea even bought back his bride what did Jesus do gave up his only son bought us all back paid for our sin And a lot of the sins that we deal with, they're not sins of commission, but rather sins of omission. They're things that maybe we don't even know that we're doing. And even the stuff we don't know we're doing or we're not actively trying to hurt God's feelings, he's already dealt with. He's already said, I'm waiting here. I love you. There may, distance may come between us, but my love for you doesn't change. The way I felt about you when I first called your name, you said, come to me. It's not changed. It's not different. And all we've got to do is just respond. Just say, I love you too, Lord. I love you too. And I'm sorry I walked away. I'm sorry I got distracted. But I'm back. And better than ever. Because that's what God does. When God repairs a, our brokenness, he makes it like new. It's like you drop a vase on the ground and it shatters into a million pieces. Get your crazy glue and you stick it all back together. Does it look new? No. But what God does is he makes it new. A clean slate. Jude 21 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, seeking out his goodness. Okay, Lord, it's dark, it's murky. I don't know what's going on in my life, but I'm going to find you. I'm going to figure out where your goodness is in this. And that's how I'm going to keep from getting bitter. That's how I'm going to keep from, from distancing myself from you. Is because if I know anything about you, I know you're steadfast. I know you're good. I know you're loving. I know you're kind. And I know you're faithful. So you're in here somewhere. You're in here. And I'm going to find you. As a kid, did you ever do one of those mystery boxes where you had to stick your hands in and you had to feel around and figure out what this is and what that is? Sometimes life feels like that. It's like 
your hand is in a box and you don't know what's in there. Maybe it's slimy and maybe it's weird and maybe it's gross, but there's good stuff in there too. That's what it's like walking with Jesus. Sometimes we can't see the next step in front of us, but we know he's good. We know he's faithful. We know he's Jehovah Jireh. We know he's Jehovah Shalom. He is with us. While I was working and preparing this lesson, I was reminded of an old Andre Crouch song. And it says, take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Take me back where I first believed. When did it all first come like this? This is the sign for believe in sign language. Believe. When did it all come like this into your heart where Jesus came and just took your hand? Would you stand with me? Lord, we remember today. We remember the place of our first love, the memorials, the altars that we've built, God, to you in times where you showed us your hand, you showed us your glory, you showed us your power, your strength, your kindness, your peace. And Lord, we, we repent, God, for the things that we've turned ourselves to, the things that we've let become more important. It's not that to the church of Ephesus that remaining steadfast wasn't important. And it's not that being patient and enduring trials and hardship with a smile on their face wasn't important. And it wasn't that hating evil wasn't important. But it had come in place of the most important thing. Lord, we give you first place in our hearts and lives. We give you first place, God. And we return to you. We return again to where we first believed, where we first knew, where we first received you.